Welcome to Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. I invite you to join me on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as a participant in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. Well, today I have a special guest, uh, Junius Johnson, here with me today. And I've been getting to know him. We've been having some great conversations about classical education and the art of teaching. And so I invited him to come on today. Really, I would like to focus on the art of teaching because I think that he has a lot of really great things to say about this topic, as well as many other topics. But this topic in particular, I felt matches our audience for our show. And I think that he has a lot of wisdom to share with us. And so uh, without further ado, uh, Junius, welcome to the show. Thank you. So good to be here. Yeah, I'd like you to tell our audience a little bit about your work in classical ed and, and what brought you here and your, what is your primary focus? Yeah, I, I have a, a, a variety of interests um, and it's uh, some might say that it's scattered, but there's a kind of coherence to it in my mind, at least. Um, and and that's that, you know, I'm interested in kind of the central question that animates classical education, which is what what is the good life and how do we live it? Um, that that leads me to be very interested in transcendental qualities of being. I'm interested in beauty and truth and goodness. I'm committed to those things at a fundamental level. I'm interested in how those things play out across art, literature, music, all these other sorts of things. But but also I'm interested in philosophy because that's our approach to truth in its own proper idiom. Uh, my own training is I have a graduate degrees in theology, philosophy, and literature. Um, and so I've, I'm a theologian by training. Um, but um, but I always tried to stay deeply rooted in those other disciplines as well, literature and philosophy, because to me, it's where those three things overlap that uh, we're doing. We're getting our clearest glimpses of the transcendent reality of which the transcendentals themselves are really an expression. Right. Um, so so what's funny for me as far as classical education goes is I, I wound up in classical education accidentally uh, by two different accidental paths. Uh, the first accidental path was in preparing to do um, advanced work, scholarly work on medieval theology, um, well, really patristic and medieval theology. So the first 1500 years of, of the Christian church, um, I needed to, to get my languages in order. I needed to be able to read Greek. I needed to be able to read Latin. And so as I pursued doing that, I found myself um, being placed in contact by great teachers with um, great writers about teaching like Quintilian and Erasmus and folks like this. And so this was before I ever knew there was a thing called classical education. And certainly before I knew there was a movement called classical education, I was reading the classical sources and resonating with them and saying, yeah, this is the way this should be done. This is very exciting to me. You know, if I ever have kids, this is how I'm going to want to do it for my kids and that sort of a thing. Um, the other accidental path was I wound up, um, there was a small co-op, a homeschool co-op um, in near where I was going to school for graduate school. And um, the parents, you know, they would get together to hire somebody to teach their children the things that they didn't feel qualified to teach them. And mm -hmm. chief among them was Latin. Um, one of the leading moms in that co-op was had been reading Charlotte Mason and she was falling in love with the classical model. And so she wanted all the kids to study Latin. So they hired me to teach Latin to these kids. Well, I didn't know thing one about teaching young children. I think they were probably uh, 11 or 12 at that point. Um, I had never spent any time with, with children, really. Um, but I needed the money, so I, so I jumped in. And it was delightful. It was wonderful. And after one year of doing that, they sort of reorganized themselves into a small classical school. And uh, she was giving us all Charlotte Mason and Dorothy Sayers and all the sort of classical texts to read um, at as we, the teachers, you know, began to try to figure out how to teach in this in this new setting, and ultimately, I wound up serving as headmaster for that little school for for a few years. Um, and it only I immediately saw the connection between what they were trying to do and what all of these writers were talking about, and what I had seen when I had been reading books like Quintilian and Erasmus, and um, and I and that just confirmed for me that yeah, this is the way this addresses a lot of the concerns that I've had about. I thought just education, but turns out there were concerns about a modern model of education, right? Yeah, I love, I'm so happy that you're bringing up Quintilian. Um, he's one of my favorites of the ancients, and 
um, I, I actually pick him up and read him often. And this weekend I was mm. reading some of his materials again, just to uh, refresh my mind because I'm going to be teaching a class with SDL on, on narration. And he, mm. his, his book is so beautiful because it really gets into the art of teaching. He, he's really a great teacher yeah. and the whole book is really about the art of teaching rhetoric yeah. and how much, how much the way we teach actually matters um, as much as what we're teaching, but the way we are teaching. And that's one yeah. of the things I really appreciate about the work I'm seeing that's coming from you. Um, and in our last discussion, I'm, some of the things I've noticed that you and I are in agreement on is that there are some um, differences in different models of classical education. And mm -hmm. we both see that there's different models. Um, but we also see that there are some problems in in classical education, maybe some disconnects and some um, even I think parents having maybe a negative view of classical education mm. because maybe they've had an experience at a classical school doing it one way and maybe they've had some problems with that, that model connecting with their child, you know? So yeah. I kind of wanted you to bring up some of these negative views of classical education that you've seen and perhaps maybe some mistakes that have been made in classical education and how how we need to focus on overcoming some of these. I think this would help yeah. our listeners to think yeah. through this issue. Yeah, so I mean it's interesting the the I think the mistakes that happen in classical education flow directly out of its values and virtues. Um and so you look at classical education and one of the values is ad fontes, primary source material, that sort of a thing. Well, the um, everything, um, and this isn't just about the classical education or education. This is everything in human life, by the way. For everything that there is, um, the virtue of it becomes the ground of a potential vice if it gets sick in some way, right? And there's all sorts of ways things can go wrong and get sick. So right. a, a value and emphasis on primary sources, what happens when that gets diseased, it turns into coverage, right? We've got to to make sure that they have read X, Y, Z and, and these sorts of things. Um, and you get these lists of, you know, books every student should read before they finish high school and, and this sort of a thing. And I I personally don't know that I think there's any single book every student has to have read before they finish high school. Students need to have learned to read, by which I don't mean basic literacy, but how to really read a literary text before they finish high school. But it doesn't matter to me whether they're learning that from Homer or... Um, J.K. Rowling, frankly, because the reality is they're going to have to really read these texts post high school anyway. So that's that's a that's a disease that comes as you start to think, okay, we've got to cover all of this material, and so you you, you start throwing a lot of material out, and when that happens, the teaching style is going to shift towards lecture heavy, because the only way to get students through a lot of text very quickly is to try to spoon feed the material to them, make sure they're noticing all of these bits and carry on. There's not as much room for discovery if you've got to get through 300 pages of this text this week, this week or this month or whatever. Um, another virtue that turns into a vice for classical education is memorization and repetition. Um, repetition is um, an invaluable means of assimilating, uh, of mastering material. This has been an underscored by neurological research in the last several decades. Um, and so the things that have been done in the past to foster memorization, we can now argue not just from um, a philosophical standpoint uh, or a pedagogical standpoint, but even from a scientific standpoint that there's value to these things. But the problem is, um, so what happens when that gets diseased is you get stuck on rote memorization. It's just saying the thing, parroting the things over and over again, right? And if it's if it's at the level of what's the difference between a parrot and a, a well-taught human child, apart from the wings and feathers, it's to do with the parrot stays at the surface level. The things the parrot says don't have any connection to the parrot's life. It's just reciting things it's heard before. And so when we get so focused on the repetition as a means of assimilating information, then the the um, the information gets disconnected from its meaning, and that is to um, disconnect it from its transcendental character, and that's anti-classical, actually. Right. Oh, I'm so happy that you said this. This is spot on exactly. This is why I had you on the show because we agree exactly on this. Um, yeah, I I, I want to camp a little bit about on this idea of of memory and and rote memorization versus 
remembering. Um, in fact, it's again, we're back to I'm prepping for this SEL <laughs> Society for Classical mm -hmm. Learning uh, workshop I'm doing on narration. And the importance of memory as it's tied to classical education is huge. Mm -hmm. um, there, I'm reading, I'm rereading uh, the, the books by Mary Carruthers, the book of memory and the mm -hmm. craft. Uh, anyhow, she, she's got a lot to say about memory and has studied it very with great, great uh, scholarship. And mm -hmm. she reiterates in her book exactly what you're saying, and that rote memory work is not classical. It is not the way that they were actually requiring their students to learn things. In yeah. fact, she even says that rote memory work was frowned upon because yeah. what they wanted were students who knew how to think and recollect and remember and recall and retell a story in their own words, which goes back to the art of rhetoric, being able to arrange and sequence the five canons. And mm -hmm. all of that brings the personality of the child into the retelling of That's something. Easy. And so really this idea, this is what my, the, the hill that I'm going to die on <laughs> is, is how narration is so important to really narration is the pedagogy of, of, of memory work. Mm -hmm. That's the closestly aligned to classical, the tradition, according mm -hmm. to like uh, Augustine and Cis, uh, uh, Quintilian. Uh, Cicero was a little bit more leaning towards rote memory work. Quintilian was not so much. But mm -hmm. I think you're right. I think this is a big mistake. Um, not that there's anything wrong with children having rote memory. I mean, mm -hmm. but back to the transcendentals, like you were saying, truth, goodness, and beauty, what we want them to memorize are the things that are beautiful. Have them yeah. memorizing poetry and scripture and the things that actually point them to the virtuous good life, right? Yeah, that's right? right? Not just these facts that they need to regurgitate later, you know, memorizing the table of elements when they're seven so that they <laughs> have them memorized when they take chemistry in high school, right? So yeah. we really, I agree. I think you are spot on. I think this, this is a very big mistake in classical education and possibly is something that has even made some parents, you know, have a disdain towards classical education. Um, and I... I think this is why our conversation today is important because um, one of my reasons for this podcast is to help mm -hmm. people be educated in the tradition of classical education mm -hmm. and re let's recover it well and let's recover it for the sake of the children so that they will learn to love learning and become lifelong learners. And I know that's a huge passion of yours talking about <clears throat> In your, the discussions we've had and in the book I've read, your book, um, Fairy Stories, on the teaching of fairy stories, just the passion that we both have, Junius, for lifelong learners, for children mm -hmm. to become lifelong learners and, and how much that matters. And the way we teach this art of teaching is going to make or break that for the yeah. students, right? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I also want to bring up in asking you to expand on that still relates to this mistake going on is um, <clears throat> one of the things that I've seen for many years, and I know you agree with me on this, visiting classrooms, classical school classrooms, and the teacher puts objectives on the board <laughs> and then lists all of the objectives that the students needs to be learning that day in grammar, in science, in math or whatever. Mm -hmm. And a lot of headmasters are requiring this. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think this is a big mistake. When I was a child, I never experienced as a student, the teacher putting on the board, the, the objectives. And I think a lot of this comes from the No Child Left Behind movement and mm -hmm. this uh, massive push towards standardized testing that the teachers feel like I have to have the objectives up there so that we're covering all the state required standards and the students know what we're covering today. But I think that by doing that, we're losing the heart of learning, the heart of yeah. engaging the students and allowing the student to really experience a good education. And I know that you talk a little bit about this, about objectives and the dangers of these. And I want you to uh, expand for our listeners a little bit yeah. more on that. You know, when I was, um, I was a professor at Baylor for about six years. And one of the things that I did while I was there was a summer faculty enrichment um, program that they, they would put on. And, it was, you know, they were really smart about it. They incentivized us doing it, uh, the tenure track faculty, they, by paying us to go. Um, and so 
Um, so I did it, um, really just for the money, but, but, um, and it was, it was a very interesting experience. I was really glad I did it because, um, even though it was taught by a, a member of the English faculty and a member of the theology faculty, the religion faculty, um, it was what they were teaching was um, education, the, um, your pedagogical stuff, right? The stuff you would learn in a school of education and master's program. Um, and this is that's where this objective stuff comes from. I mean, this is a this is quintessentially modern. The idea that you want to have um, it, it's outcome based, right? And so it's pragmatic from the from the very start. Um, they would say things like, you know, an objective has to be something that is quantifiable. Right. 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 Yes. And so it can't be something like students will learn to better appreciate the point. That's not an objective. That's a goal. An objective has got to be quantifiable. You've got to be able to measure it. You should be able to answer the question, how will we know and how can you prove to your department that the students have met this objective? Right. Well, that's a far cry from the, the vision of classical education which is not focused on pragmatic outcomes, which is not focused on uh, particular bodies of knowledge, even. The goal of the classical education is not that the students know X, Y, Z, and be able to tick off all these boxes. The goal of classical education is that the students be good human beings, right? And being a good human being is precisely not the kind of thing you can quantify, because if being a good human being were quantifiable, then that would be reductionistic to what it means to be human that reduces us to learning units or to mechanisms or to these types of things. But if the human creature is not just something that is addressed by and oriented to transcendence, but itself participates in transcendence, if the human being has a spiritual as well as a physical nature, however you interpret that, then it's going to be resistant to quantifiability and to try to reduce it to that is going to be. So what happens when you come to the classroom with this, you're coming at the students in a way that first of all, is contrary to the, the, the model you're trying to speak out of. If you want to teach classically and you're leaning heavily on objectives, you're actually undercutting the branch that you sit on, but you're also, you, you're telling the students something about what their task is in the classroom, right? It promotes, is this going to be on the test thinking? That's true. It does. Right. Yes. It promotes, um, okay, I finished the assignment. Now I have read Dante thinking, <laughs> right? Right. There's no, there's no room in a classical model for checklists of, I have read Dante. I have read Milton. I have read. No, no, no. What you've done when you finish the divine comedy is you've begun your lifelong relationship with Dante. You begin your lifelong exploration of Milton. It's not checking things off. It's getting things started, right? Um, it's much more open. It's much more Socratic, not just between the teacher and the students and not even primarily between the teacher and the students. The, where the Socratic dialogue happens is between the students and the text. Dante asks me the hard questions that, that I can't answer that lead me to an aporia that causes me to want to know what the way forward is. All the teacher's doing is facilitating that encounter. And so I, I agree. I think it's a very grave error. It's, it's, it's such an easy thing to do. And it makes it it's very understandable to me why you would think this is going to help everybody be on the same page and make sure we all know what, you know, what we're trying to do here and whatnot. But I think it, it actually is a Trojan horse that brings in a lot of negative energy and a lot of negative assumptions and, um, and implicit um, doctrine that is going to be at odds with what we're trying to do in the classical classroom. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you on that. And I know that's not something easy for a lot of teachers to hear because they've been trained that this matters and it's important. Um, yeah. But I think that it is a very dangerous practice. Uh, it's something simple that a teacher can stop doing and hopefully, you know, take this to their headmaster and say, you know, we're doing something here in our classical school that maybe we should reconsider. You know, And I also realize and appreciate that a lot of classical schools are charter schools. Mm -hmm. They still mm -hmm. have to meet the state standards. I've worked with all of them, but you can still do this without yeah. setting up your classroom in a way that makes the students feel like, oh, is it going to be on the test? Because you're 100 percent right. That's exactly what that tells the students. Yeah, yeah um, that's right. And one of the one of the metaphors that I love that you use, and I'd like you to expand more on this, because I think this gets into the heart of of what it means to be a good teacher and to mm -hmm. allow good discussion going on in the classroom is your metaphor of dancing. And mm -hmm. I particularly love that because I was in ballet and I was a ballet mm -hmm. teacher. And it's a metaphor that I use often when I'm training teachers is that uh, 
that education and learning is a dance between the students and the teacher and the material you're studying. And I think that this particular metaphor dance is so much better than the metaphor tool that we hear so often in mm -hmm. our education circles. And um, so I would like you to uh, expand on that and, and, and just challenging other classical education uh, teachers to think about dance as a metaphor that's really in line with the Greek philosophy, because even in the Republic and the muses that are often depicted as dancing, mm -hmm. how important that metaphor is. And I love the things that you have said about dancing in the art of teaching. I'd like you to talk with that to that uh, with our te with our teachers and explain what that means. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I th it's such a, um, so if we're, if the model is not going to be lecture, right, I'm going to stand in front of you and I'm going to deliver my content. And this is, I, I talk about this a lot, even in the context of university education. Um, the, the, the temptation with university professors is to be lecturers, right? And the difference between a lecturer and a teacher is a lecturer's job is done when he or she has delivered the material. Right, you're, you're you're meant to go and lecture, and when you've done lecturing, you've done your job. Um, the teacher's job is only done when the students have learned the material, which is a much more nebulous endpoint. I can't assume that when I go into a class that I've taught six times before, but with a different group of students, that by 15 minutes in the class we'll be at the same spot that we were before. Um, I don't know what it's going to take and how long it's going to take for these students to understand what it is that I'm hoping they'll understand coming out of that class. And so the teacher, unlike the lecturer, the lecturer is static. You can read your notes if you're a lecturer because you just got to get it out there into the world. If you're a teacher, you got to be constantly responding to what the students are giving you and you're trying to get them to go this way. It's like herding sheep, right? I mean, you're, you're trying to move them along and they keep wanting to know, bah, what's over there? You know, and you've got, nope, don't go over that way. That's, that's a cliff, right? Come back this way. Um, and so there's a constant adaptability and adjustment that goes on in the teacher's classroom versus in the lecturer's classroom. And um, when I thought about that in relation to the larger, so that's the classroom, let's step out of the classroom, the larger practice of I'm getting a student coming in who has never encountered, I'm just going to stick with Dante, who's never encountered Dante before. Um, okay, Dante is daunting, right? That's why he's called Dante. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, he's daunting <laughs> for us. Um, it's hard. It's a hard, hard text. It's unlike what they've done before. Most of them have never read that much poetry before, right? Um, there's a lot of challenges for a modern American uh, or even just Westerner in general coming to Dante. Um, they have no reason to like it right off the bat. Um, and they don't understand how helpful it can be for their lives. And I really can't tell them that, right? I can only show them how helpful he can be for their lives. And that's true of a lot more stuff than we think it is as well. It's hard for you to tell me anything. You have to just kind of show me in some form. So what I've got to do is I've got to create an environment where the student is invited into a relationship with Dante, and then I've got to superintend that relationship that as the student is drawing back, I can help Dante to pursue, help that text pursue the student, but never overtake the student. You're always trying to, the pursuit is one of, you know, and now I'm thinking about, so let's think about two dancers. Uh, let's just take a male and a female dancer, and Dante is the male dancer, and the student is the female dancer, and the male dancer reaches out a hand, and he's he's lovely, and he's got good lines, and his leg is pointed very well, and so the student <laughs> reaches out and takes his hand, and Dante kind of pulls her in a bit, and then something, she remembers something, or something isn't quite right, and she draws back, and she turns her back, and she starts to go across the stage, and Dante pursues with his hand out. But he can't rush over and grab her and haul her back to the center of the stage. He's got to get her to turn back around to reconsider and see that outstretched hand and maybe come back towards the hand a little bit and take it and, and bring it back this way. It's that give and take, that sense of um, I'm going to invite without ever compelling. I'm going to give you space to push back and run away, but I'm not myself ever going to sever. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to pursue without overtaking so that because between the two dancers, there's a space of tension and that tension, you know, this super well, you know, this better than I do. That tension grows as they pull apart and relaxes as they pull together, usually. Um, but what we're looking for as the choreography or what, what, what the dance does to us as the audience is the it, it happens by means of the manipulation of that tension. Right. And the best dances. I'm thinking things like Swan Lake and Giselle and stuff like this. Um, 
that tension is stretched almost to the breaking point, but that dance resolves with those two dancers in each other's arms. And that's that's the consummation that it all aims at, right? And that's not at all because the, the act of teaching is not a choreographed ballet. It's not a given that we'll reach that point um, at the end of the semester. So there has to be invitation and also respect that allows space for the student to wander because um, because it is a dance, they have to take all those steps around the stage. They've got to walk their path if they're going to have a chance of arriving at that final space. Uh, uh, yes. I love I love that metaphor. It's very much in keeping with um, Charlotte Mason um, talking about how, I mean, she says education is a, um, a relationship, the science of relations, she calls it. And she, her whole philosophy is what you're saying. It's rooted in this idea of giving students the time to wrestle with text and to develop that relationship with everything they're studying, even nature, outside nature study, mm. and for the teacher to not get in the way. And yeah. she's not, her philosophy is not Rousseauian mm. in the idea of just completely leaving them to their own their own way and figuring things out on their own. She, as the teacher, is guiding, like what you were saying mm -hmm. earlier. The teacher is a guide and kind of helping herd the sheep back from falling off the cliff. And <laughs> the teacher is tasked with giving the students the beautiful materials from which to learn and to yeah. uh, become engaged in that dance. And I think that's something that you uh, speak very much about in your books, in your fairy book, and in the conversations we've had is how important it is for the teacher to give that space. I love how you just said it a minute ago, the space to to kind of wrestle with or have the tension mm -hmm. with the thing they're learning. And that I think is somewhat where the rigor comes in. The rigor comes in from the tension that the student is having with the materials, not so much the rigor of we have to, you know, memorize everything and recite it. And, <laughs> but to, to give them, I love that you said to give them that space. I think mm -hmm. that's a huge thing that's in the art of teaching that is lacking yeah. in uh, a lot of classrooms. Um, because it is scary for a teacher who has this huge burden of responsibility to make sure mm -hmm. they're meeting these objectives, you know, <laughs> they're, they're doing their yeah. job and the students are really learning. Um, so it's hard for the teacher to kind of let go and allow that tension. Do you have any advice you can give to teachers on, on how to help that happen? I know you've talked a little bit about Socratic discussion in the classroom. Well, speak into that a little bit. I think that the student, the teacher has to trust that the students have human hearts. They have human hearts, humane hearts, I might almost say. What's true about human hearts? Human hearts were, as Quintilian tells us, humans were made to learn. It's, it's as natural to us as running is to a horse and swimming is to a fish. It's what we do. Um, human hearts also are made to wonder. To long, to, to, Aristotle describes wonder as um, the response that you have when you, you see a phenomenon and you're ignorant of its cause. And so you wonder what is the cause of that. It's not my favorite definition of wonder, but it'll, it'll get us off the ground. We're made to look at the world and see the way the world exceeds our understanding or our being or whatever else and pursue that more, to chase the more that is seen in that moment. Um, I think the teacher's got to trust that the students will respond if they're shown beauty, if they're shown goodness, real goodness, not fake goodness, which is on sale everywhere, right? Real truth, not personal truth but a truth that has no, it doesn't care about you in a sense. A truth that's going to be true whether you like it or not, right? Um, we have to trust that these things are going to be attractive. I was reminded as you were talking of um, Plato's Mino, which is famous mm. for the, you know, causing the slave boy to recollect the Pythagorean theorem, essentially. And uh, Socrates is like, I'm not teaching him anything. I'm just asking him questions. And we're all like, right. oh, that's teaching, dude. Um, but um, <laughs> right before that, the one of the reasons he does that in the dialogue is because Mino says to him, um, you know, you have this reputation, Socrates. Everyone says that you're always confused and that when people talk with you, they get confused too. And now I feel like I understand what they're saying because the more we talk, the more confused I get. And... And Socrates doesn't respond to that immediately, but he starts teaching the slave boy. And he, and he gets the slave boy to say, okay, so this is a two by two. So what's the area? Oh, it's going to be four. Right. Okay. So if I double that and make it four by four, what's the area? Oh, it's going to be eight. And Socrates is like, see, that's wrong, right? 
And then he leads the voyage. He draws it out and says, well, look, count this up. Oh, that's not eight. That's 16. So how are we going to get to eight? And he says, well, that's halfway between those two. So maybe if we have a three by three, that'll be an eight. But of course, we know three by three is a nine. And so that's wrong too. And it's like, ah, how do I get there? Right. And he leads him into Pythagorean theorem. But before he gets, before he turns him towards the solution, when three by three fails, Socrates turns to Mino and says, do you see how perplexed he is? Do you see that he is in confusion? And Mino's like, oh yeah. And Socrates says, but don't you think he's better off now that he's confused than he was when he thought he knew the answer was four by four? And Mino says, yeah, I think he is. Right. 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 And so we've got to trust as teachers that if we get the students to that place where they can see the problem for themselves, they're not going to say, well, I just don't care. I don't, mind. I don't care. I'm fine not knowing what the answer is. They're going to get curious. And right, because you, the you. tension is there. Like what yes. you just said, the tension is there. And as humans, we want to resolve the tension. Yes. We need to resolve the tension. That's like watching a movie, right, with the climax and then turning it off. Oh, my gosh, why'd you turn that movie off? It was right <laughs> into the good part. I, you know? yep. Yeah, sometimes we don't, Sometimes my wife and I will have to go to bed before we're done watching a movie. Um, right. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll keep waking up in the middle of the night trying to remember how the movie ended because my brain is like, wait, I don't have resolution about this, right? Exactly. Exactly. I love that. I love that. And it gets more fun to watch students as they get older and they have more and more stories and knowledge, you know, built up inside of them. And mm -hmm. then they start making connections, those relational connections from one author to another. And it, and that's, that right there is what we want to happen because that's what creates a lifelong learner. Yes. That's what creates the love of learning because they're ignited and there's a spark in them that happens because they're like, oh, I actually know things and I'm actually seeing connections. And that's the role of a teacher Yeah, is to exactly. help students get to that point right there. Yes. yes. And we can never guarantee that. And so, first of all, whatever you're doing to guarantee that that happens, know that that's going to fail. Um, it, it, will, it will fall short of giving you a guarantee. Since you can't have a guarantee, you can take more risks. And we can sew to that, right? So I was teaching a course this past semester called Fantastic Literature. And um, and so I would just I would sign a bunch of different books that have fantastical elements in them. So we read The Sword and the Stone, T.H. White. We read um, uh, various other things. And one of the things that the students pointed out as we got late in the course, they were like, wow, you know, a lot of the books that we're reading have this, um, have a character who is living backwards in time or has a weird relationship to time. And they're picking up on Merlin in T.H. White's Sword in the Stone and on, um, uh, and on the, the, the characters in The Looking Glass world in Lewis Carroll's The Looking Glass, and then uh, the old ones in Susan Cooper's The Darkest Rising sequence, who all are either going backwards or have a different relationship to time. And they were they gotten fascinated by that when we saw it in Merlin, and they saw it keep coming up, right? And even in we read a, a story called So You Want to Be a Wizard. Um, and even there, there was an interesting thing going on with time and manipulation of time and whatnot. And um, and so they were they were so excited. Whoa, like, look at all these different things. And then they immediately wanted to talk about them in relation to one another, right? And to them, they've just discovered this incredible connection in these texts. And it's true. They have discovered it. It's also true that I put that there. I planned these books together for just that reason, right? Just because you're not the first person to see it, just because somebody put it there for you to stumble over and discover doesn't mean you aren't discovering it. And it doesn't take anything away from your discovery of it. That's good. That's good. Yeah. In fact, if if you were in a classroom where the teacher thought she had to have her objectives up on the board, <laughs> right? they may right? have never gone down that path because they would have thought, well, we can't talk about this because it's not one of the objectives on the board. Or, or even worse, yes. the teacher would say, well, we're not talking about that right now because that's not one of the objectives for today. That's, yeah. you know, or oh my goodness, even worse than even the moment. <laughs> worse, right? Even worse, sir. The teacher writes on the board as one of the objectives, notice the theme of time across these various texts. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? And exactly. Which is, which is, that's how you, she's trying to guarantee that the students will get that that's there. But in trying to guarantee it, she takes away their agency. And learning won't yeah. work without agency. You can't make a lifetime learner out of a student by making them passive. 
They've got to be active if that's going to be something. Because the goal is for them to take what you do and own it, right? The difference between me and my students is not my incredible erudition or my amazing experience or some talents I've been given that they can never have. The difference is I've been down this road further than they have. I've been walking this road for longer. And it's as one who has seen what the next several steps of their journey look like that I can come back and give them the advice that's called teaching. But the goal is for them to turn into me, for them to be teachers at the very least of themselves, if not also of others. And there may be moments in the class where the students notice things in the text that you didn't even ever notice. You're learning now from them. That's the I've best seen thing that happen teaching. many times. That is the best thing it about is, teaching. It, 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 it's and that's reasons. why it's it's more fun to teach this way than to lecture. Yes. Because you actually, you get to allow these moments where you see these sparks igniting in the students yes. that you weren't even expecting to happen. Right. I'm not, not just a teacher. I'm a scholar. And I'm, I'm engaged in scholarly writing and I'm engaged in public intellectual work and whatnot. And I'm a better teacher because I do that. That informs my teaching and gives me content constantly new things to bring out of the storehouse for the students. But I'm also a better scholar and public intellectual because I teach, because students point to things in text. They ask a question about something, and I'm like, I've never thought about that. That is a great question. Let's talk about that together. And we explore it together. Or they say, what if that doesn't mean what you're suggesting? Maybe it means this. What if it's not? What if it's this? And I'm like, oh, that's good. Let's let's, Mm -hmm. let's sit on that for a while. So this this relates to what you were just saying about the objectives and the way the objectives stifle the teacher in the classroom because they become these rails that the train has to stay on to go down, right? Not just the mo- not just the best teaching, it is the best teaching, but not just the best teaching, also the most fun teaching happens in, an, in, an, in a sandbox, in an open world. This is, these are video game terms. I wanna take a quick break to tell you about a four week class that I will be leading in February. The Society for Classical Learning invited me to lead a narration intensive for their 2024 winter workshops. This four-week narration intensive is for anyone who wants to practice the three stages of narration and who wants to dive into the deep roots of the tradition of memory and the trivium as they function within the art of narration. This is a great class for anyone who really wants to understand the primacy of narration as the bedrock of the trivium arts. Participants will experience how narration is a grammatical, dialectical, and rhetorical art that lays the foundations for acquiring moral and intellectual habits. Check out the Society for Classical Learning Winter Workshops and scroll through to find out more about the in-depth workshop on narration that I'll be leading. The link to register for this workshop is in the show notes of this episode. I look forward to meeting you on Zoom for this fun and engaging upcoming workshop. Register soon because there's only a short window of time still left to register. Thank you for listening. And now back to the show. In in the old days, video games had to, you had to stay in a very narrow corridor because everything that you saw had to be pre-drawn. And if you would step outside of it, the perspective would change and you wouldn't be able to, they they can't get all that in there. Um, And so you follow a corridor or you walk down. It may look like this beautiful world around you, but you can only go on this narrow path, right? And then as the technology uh, developed and they were able to have the computer do the work of generating a lot of that perspective and not have to draw every possible angle themselves, then the rails went away and they gave you an open world and you could walk to the side. And if you could see it on screen, you could go there and that sort of a thing. The teacher needs to create that kind of a world in their classroom where you come in today. Yes, come in with your three. I usually have two or at most three things I'd like the students to see by the end of the classroom. I try to have no more than 20 minutes out of every 60 planned when I go into a classroom because the uh, the rest of it has got to be space to follow up on what's drawing their attention. If I see a student who's just like on fire about the idea of Merlin living backwards and can't let it go and really wants to dig into that, I don't want to be in a position of having to say, we can't talk about that because we don't have time. We've got to move on. We've got to get this other stuff in. So I have to make sure that I'm planning enough time for their loves to condition and determine a significant portion of what's going to happen in the classroom. And that makes me, I can't wait to step into the classroom every day because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what I'm going to learn, much less what they're going to learn. I don't know what things, their questions and ideas are going to make me say that I might furiously write down after the class is over because I think I need to write about this. That's really good. Yeah, that's really good. That's a good, and I think that's, 
I think what you're saying in my mind, that's a lot of what makes or ought to make the classical school different mm -hmm. than any other school. Yeah. The classical school ought to allow for those kinds of conversations. That's very Socratic. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if we have teachers listening, like history, math, Latin teachers, mm -hmm. you know, how, how do you make this happen in say a math or a Latin classroom? Yeah, yeah. You gotta have imagination to be a teacher. Let's just get that out there, right? If if you're if you're unimaginative, uncreative in every way, teaching is going to be a hard profession for you. Because it's all about imagination is the part of ourselves that we use when we face a problem that we've never faced before and we have to come up with a solution. That's imagination, right? Not reason. Reason can only work with stuff we know. Imagination can find stuff we didn't know before. No idea if it'll work or not, but here's the thing you could try, right? So, what I answer is going to boil down to you've got to use your imagination, right? What does that look like concretely? Well, remember that the goal, whether you're teaching history or chemistry or Latin or whatever else, the goal is for the student to catch a glimpse of how cool that subject matter is so that they want to know more, right? Yeah. Ooh, tell me more about the Peloponnesian War. I'm glad you asked, right? That's that's every teacher's dream, right? Um, so what are you doing? You're looking for where what makes the student light up and how can you build on that? Now, before class starts, before the first day of school, you have no idea what's going to make any of the students light up. But the good news is, A, your students are humans, which means they belong to the same species that everyone else you've ever tried to teach does. <laughs> that's really helpful, right? Teaching a Martian sight unseen would be challenging. Set B, they are Westerners. They belong to the same culture that you belong to, right? And so you've got some more commonality there. Um, and C, they are they belong to they've been formed in similar ways by culture to the other students you taught in the past. Mm -hmm. All of this, none of this gives you a necessary like if if I do this this way, then it, then it will work with them. Sorry, that's not going to happen. But it gives you what Timaeus calls in the dialogue of the same name likely stories, right? It's likely that if I bring them this type of stuff, they will get involved. And then you shift and adjust as things go on. So in that first game plan you build for your class, um, let's talk about Latin for a second, because I do a lot, do a lot of Latin teaching. Um, listen, every Latin teacher knows that Latin teachers face a major challenge in terms of getting students to engage and like the material, especially because there's no getting around the amount of rote memorization that has to happen in Latin. You just, you're gonna have to do a ton of it. Um, but there's so much you can do right up front to help them see Latin as a language rather than as a code. I think students, Latin students naturally think that it's a code. A code is a form of communication that is meant to keep out everyone except the select few who have the key. Language, by contrast, is a form of communication that is meant to be public and to let absolutely anyone who cares to come in, come in to the communication. So when you humanize Latin, when you help them to see things like, you know, there's a Latin word for underwear, because underwear is a thing that humans think about, and the ancient Romans thought about it too, right? <laughs> <laughs> it helps to humanize the language for them. When you help them to see, yeah, okay, these declensions, I get it. There's a ton of forms. What's going on with that? Let's go back to the communication problems that Latin is trying to solve, right? How do you know who did what to whom? How does English handle it? Okay, that's a way to do it. Now note some of the ambiguities introduced by that way of doing it. Note the inflexibility. Tom hit Jane with the ball. I can't change that to Jane hit Tom with the ball. It becomes a different sentence. Right. Latin has a different strategy for doing that. Look what they, so now all of a sudden the cases aren't this random torture device come up by the Romans, which let's be honest, it's exactly the kind of thing the Romans would do. Um, but <laughs> rather, they're a clever way of addressing a communication challenge that English also has to way of, have a way of addressing, right? What this does is it gives the students hooks to hang their hats on, hooks to hang their hearts on. That's how you capture students and draw them in. You can create, if it's a history class, you can create narratives, right? We're going to look at, um, one of the, my favorite things I taught, a, 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 wasn't a history class, it was a literature class, medieval literature. And I would start with Beowulf and we would end with Hamlet, which is not medieval, but it's okay. And, and so you have two kings of Denmark at the bookends of the semester. And right. one of the themes that ran throughout all the books that we read wasn't the only theme. I never have only one theme, but one of the themes was, what's a good king? 
what are the duties of a good king? What are the characteristics of a good king? How does that answer change across different societies and across the space of a thousand years? Right. Those are the types of things you have to do because if you do those things, if you can catch a student with something like that, you don't have to worry about them doing their homework. You don't need right. to assign tests just to find out if they've done the reading or if, or whatever, because they, they'll be begging you to tell them more, to give them more reading about it, to tell them what happens next. Right. Okay. Here's a question that I think maybe somebody would be asking. So if you were teaching that class, would you tell them at the beginning of the semester, one of the themes I want you to be looking for while you're reading this semester is what makes a good king? Would you say that at the beginning of the semester? Absolutely not. You wouldn't? And, okay. And I wouldn't, I would talk about, you know, Beowulf thematizes it, right? Um, twice in, no, three times in the, in the tale, about three different kings, it says, that was a good king. It says it about Shield Sheafson. And what makes Shield yeah. Chiefson a good king is that he smashes the meat hall benches and shatters people and destroys their hope and takes all their plunder back because nobody will mess with his people because they are so powerful. And then he says it about Hrothgar, who is who does not, we don't see doing those things. Hrothgar has to have somebody else come from overseas to kill his monster for him. But Hrothgar is called a good king because he's the ring giver. He gives gifts and presents to his people, to his warriors, which guarantees their loyalty and provides safety for his people. And then Beowulf, before he faces the dragon, is called a good king. He was a good king because he was the shield of his people, right? And so there's a theme that emerges within Beowulf about what's common to a good king, even though the three kings look very different to one another within the text. So we'll talk about that in Beowulf, and then I'll just let it go, and we'll go on to the next thing. And then before you know it, we're reading the quest of the Holy Grail, and King Arthur comes up. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they start asking questions about whether Arthur's a good king based upon the discussion we had in Beowulf. Sure, um, that makes complete sense, right. That's what I want them to do. I want, I want, I want to leave breadcrumbs. I never, never road signs, just breadcrumbs. Right, so you're asking those questions kind of sporadically after the reading mm -hmm. and allowing them to kind of have those light bulb moments and look back at the text and go, oh, for them to go back and go, oh, well, what did this say about this king? What did this say yes. about this king? And then have that conversation in the classroom where one yeah. says, oh, well, I'm not sure if I agree with that. You know, and then you're having this wonderful dialectic moment going on in your classroom. I think that's what yeah. you're saying, right? That's right. And furthermore, their writing assignment is going to give them a chance to take that realization they just had in class and take it back and explore the text more in, in terms of that. Right. Mm -hmm. So many times, um, this college students are bad about this. Well, I will assign reading and they'll read it and they'll have, they'll struggle with it and they'll come into class and we'll talk about it and they will just have their minds blown and they'll come up to me afterwards and they'll say, I wish you told us all that before I read it because I would have enjoyed it more. And I'm going to say, go back and reread it. Now, now you're ready to read, but you needed to see what right. you could get on your own first and then see what it looks like to get more out of it. And then that makes you curious to go back and dive in again. And so for your paper, I want you to write about this thing that grabbed you in class that you didn't see when you read it. And now you're going to have to go back into the text and read it again in order to talk about that and flesh that out. I love that because you're modeling for them, too, that rereading something is OK, that it's a good thing to reread something. Yeah. That yeah you, that, and that encouraging them, you know that, what, right? reread this again when you're 35. Yes. Yes. <laughs> one thing I will say explicitly. It's going to be different. Students, one thing I will say explicitly is anything worth reading is worth reading twice. That's right. This, That's this, right. If, if you don't read it twice, you don't think it was worth reading once. Right. And many things need to be read multiple times before you finally actually get it. <laughs> yes. And, and everything that's any good at all, anything that deserves to be on your list of books that you're teaching in your classical school needs to be read for your whole life. It needs to be read over That's and over right. again. You know, that's so um, true. And you know, how do I find the time to do it? That's a challenge. That's a challenge for me, not just for you. I do this professionally, right? But but I'm a professional reader and I have trouble rereading everything I like to reread. But the point is not, it's like when Jesus says, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. And you're like, you know, all the hands go up and they're like, how can we do that? Right? Have you read the rest of the Bible? The fact that you can't do it doesn't mean that it's not the goal. Does it mean that it's not the norm that controls how you need to approach life and make your decisions? Right, right, right. Now, and one of the things I, I again, I'm going to go back to the math teacher, um, just thinking through how we just talked about, like, uh, the idea of uh, what makes a good king 
and having these dialectic conversations in in that literature class. So in a math class, some things that I would think would make it kind of go that direction would be having students come up to the board to solve a problem mm -hmm. and allowing them to walk, like sort of almost teach it, show mm -hmm. how they solved it and then say, did anybody else solve it this way or did somebody do it differently? And how did you do it? How did you get to your answer? Having them come up to the board and show how they got the answer yeah. and then allowing that dialectics of conversation of, it's t interesting to see, oh, I solved the puzzle a different way than you did, but got the yeah. same answer. Yeah. Would, would you so, agree that that's a good thing to do in math? Yeah, for sure. I think, I think in math and uh, all the STEM stuff, discovery mm -hmm. is so important. Right, and mm -hmm. there are there are good people out there working on this now. Uh, William Carey and Bobby Jane are both mathematicians who are working on, um, you know, teaching math classically, and going back to Euclid and using Euclid as a text for teaching math. Um, because and what they're what they're getting out of it is, we want the students to derive the formulas for themselves, and so rather than right. saying here's the Fibonacci sequence, memorize it. They present them with the same types of stimulus that led Fibonacci to discover the Fibonacci sequence in the first place. Good, and, good. And, but now they can get there faster because they're guided by somebody who knows the answer, right? And they can walk you through it. But still, they're having the classroom time is spent discovering the principles, discovering the formulae. And then you, you can say, okay, now that you've discovered that together as a class, let me show you some of the things you could do with that. And your homework is going to enable you to use that thing we discovered in class together, and you're going right. to see how powerful a tool it is you just came up with. And see, this to me, oh my goodness, I would probably love math if I learned it that way. But I always right. grew up thinking, I'm just not a math person. Yep. But you know what? That's not true. Yes. That statement of I'm not a math person or I'm a math person and you're not a math person. No, we are all human beings and we were created numerically, musically, mm -hmm. and language. Like, so... Trivium, quadrivium, numbers and words. We were created to do both. Yep. It we aren't one more than another. I think that many of us think we're not math people because we were taught math in such a way that yep. we didn't get to experience that, that, like you said, the imagination, the discovery, the wonder, and how important this is in teaching. Um, one question I have for you to help some teachers that earlier you mentioned that if you are a teacher and you struggle with having an imagination, then teaching is going to be very hard for you. What are mm -hmm. some things that you would suggest for a person who feels discouraged in that way or feels like, oh, I don't have a good imagination? How could they develop their imagination? What would you suggest for them? Yeah, good. First of all, ask everybody you meet what they do, right? People love to tell you about how they do things and advice is free and you never have to take it, right? So, so gather more data about what's what the range of possibilities that are actually being used are that's the first thing because the reality is you know you and I will get to talking and you'll say oh I did this I, I do this when I when I teach this kind of thing and I'll be like whoa I never thought of that before I like that right mm. and it's not you know sometimes we'll say in our culture I'm stealing that it's like well that's not how knowledge works it's not stealing it's 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 common it's our common property um so first of all, do that, right? Just just sort of pull the masses and figure out what other teachers are doing. Jump on a Facebook group for people teaching your subject in the same sort of way, right? And, and ask, oh, how do you guys do this sort of thing? Just begin to get some more insight. Now, but all of that is just growing your understanding of what's, of what's out there. You can grow your imagination. Now, this is really interesting. The imagination is one of those things like vision that only gets better by using it. So um, imagine you're in a, in a completely dark room, no windows, and it's pitch black. It doesn't matter whether your eyes are open or closed. You see the same thing, right? And then um, and imagine that there's a bright noonday sun outside, and I throw open the shutters and open the door and, and thrust you out into the sunlight. Um, that sunlight is not going to illuminate the world for you. It's going to defeat your power of vision. You'll go blind, right? And, and it'll take a long time for you to adjust and get ready. Um, so what do I have to do to get you ready for that bright sunlight? His, this is really fascinating. There is absolutely nothing that we know of in all of existence that can make you ready to see large amounts of light other than small amounts of light. Mm -hmm. That's the premise of the Paradiso. Dante, he, can, mm -hmm. he, he gets to the first heaven and he's dazzled. He can't, and his eyes get used to it and he begins to see and he goes up to the next level and he's dazzled and his eyes get used to it. And as he ascends, there's more 
more and more light, and he gradually gets used to the more and more light until he's at last able to look upon God at the very end of the poem, which defeats his memory, by the way. Um, so same thing with the imagination. The way your imagination grows is you got to open it up to possibilities you've never imagined before. How do you think thoughts you've never thought before? Get help. Read fantastical fiction, right? Mm -hmm. um, read um, really, you know, read someone like uh, M.C. Escher um, or... Um, or, or Girdle, or something like this, right? Or Hofstetter's, he's got a really great, great book on these guys um, that are talking, they're, that are writing in a beautiful humanity sort of way about math and about numbers mm -hmm. to expand your understanding of the concept of number and how it gets applied in various ways and whatnot. Um, you got to go beyond the borders, the borders of your everyday life and experience new things in order mm -hmm. to expand your ability to um, think about what types of things might be possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Junius, off the air, we're gonna get some titles that we can put in the show notes. Mm -hmm. I want you to give some good titles and things. And I'm also thinking things like take a class, like there are so many, like there's a, a Lily and Thistle it's called. I'll put the show link in. And I've been taking some watercoloring classes from her mm -hmm. online and they're for parents for their children, but you can do a watercoloring class, take, yeah. take a watercolor class. And they're pretty affordable. If you do them all, you can even get YouTube videos, you know, for learning how to do a craft that you've never done before. Um, painting, crocheting, um, those can help, I think, open up your imagination, going outside and yeah. picking a flower and turning it upside down. And just mm -hmm. looking and studying that the leaf or the petals carefully and mm -hmm. imagining, you know, how God created this flower. I think just those little tiny things could be helpful. Um, if you have anybody in your family, like a niece or a nephew, if you're a, an adult teacher and you don't have any children, um, say you have a three-year-old niece or nephew, ask uh, ask your brother or sister if you can babysit the niece or nephew for a few hours that'll help yep. your imagination yes it will uh, yeah. or take the child and, and out really for a walk them, right here yes. try to spend time with them to see how they see the world and ask them questions yes like it, when they show you something ask them well how do you know that yeah tell me more about that don't um, assume that you don't assume that you know better than they do right like right. so you know the idea that you know wow why is water falling from the sky Oh, it's just rain. No, what's the oh? It's, maybe it's a witch, and 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 stay with it. What if it is a witch actually? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. Lay down on the ground outside and look at clouds, mm -hmm. and just start finding shapes. These are easy, easy ways to get your imagination to begin to mm -hmm. to to develop. I think picture study, looking at a beautiful painting, and imagining yourself in the painting. What would you hear? What would you smell if you were in that mm -hmm. painting? I think those are really simple ways to to develop an imagination. And if you have, if you're a teacher in a classroom and you have students that you're having a hard time engaging with them, and maybe you've been struggling with uh, having imagination in your classroom, do something different. Print off a beautiful picture, a painting. Um, I'll put a couple examples of ones to start with in the show notes. I'm thinking of um, oh, the Dutch painter. Uh, that did the children's games painting. Uh, Mayor. Uh, uh, oh, I can't even believe I can't think of the name of Bruegel, Bruegel, Bruegel oh, the yeah. Elder. So the Bruegel paintings, uh, just print them in color, project them on the wall and mm -hmm. start off class. Hey, today we're going to just look at this painting for five minutes and then we're going to turn it off and everybody tell back everything they remember. Yeah. And that's just a great way to get the kids engaged in a conversation that may have nothing to do with what you're going to teach. Yeah. But you've just kind of began to set the stage of having an imaginatory conversation in your classroom. I think those are some just practical things that teachers can do if they're yeah. struggling with imagination or have a classroom that struggles with imagination. I love that because you're not saying, you know, to take a vacation to the south of France or travel to see the Grand Canyon or something like this, which, you know, come on, we're teachers. We don't have that kind of money. Yeah, or time. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to go to the end of the world to see that. There's another book that for the show notes, um, G.K. Chesterton's Tremendous Trifles, okay. uh, which is absolutely delightful. The premise of the book, it actually was a series of articles that he wrote for some newspaper and then it published them together as a book later. But the premise of the book is that um, 
you know, you you don't have to travel to the end of the world to have your mind blown. You've just got to look more closely at the little things around you. And, and this, the essays are all a series of it's things like, um, you know, I was playing a game of croquet with my friend and I and I hit some crazy good shots and it terrified me to death. Or, you know, I was on the train and I was like, what have I got in my pocket? And I went through the things in my pocket or whatnot. And they're hilarious and they're beautiful. Or they're powerfully written or whatnot. And, you know, that's a book you can read one of those you can, we can knock out a chapter of that, read one of those essays in probably 10 minutes. and you know. If, oh, if that's great. Know. Yeah, I'm going to have to get that. I guess another book I would recommend to teachers is called The Awakening of Miss Prim. Ooh. Fantastic story. Yeah. Junius, you will love this book. Mm. Fantastic story about how to awaken the imagination. Um, and playing games. If, you, if you're not a person who, or you think, I hate playing games, you know what? Come out of, <laughs> come out of your little... You know, your little realm, your little walled box of hating games, find some people in your school who love games and say, hey, can I join you for a game night one night? Just step yeah. out of the realm of comfort, right? And right. go play some games. You may find that you actually like some of them. Every animal plays. It's not just yeah. humans. And so it's fundamental to us to play. Um, you're right. No, yeah. no one doesn't like games. You just had bad experiences. That's exactly right. Maybe you lost a lot as a child or you fought a lot with your sibling who cheated all the time. So you've had this horrible trauma of playing games and you well, just hate you games. Have a terrible family culture of, you know, that they're bad losers or they yeah. make them back for losing or whatnot. All those yeah. things. But, but the game itself, right? There's something that can draw you back in. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I, I'm really addicted to this game called Splendor. I'll put it in the show notes. Splendor oh, is a yeah, fun game. Splendor. I, I love that. that game. Yeah. We've also been playing golf, which is a card game. You play 18 holes. <laughs> it's a nice. fun one. You can look up golf. You know, so there's a lot of fun games. And Lords of the Water Deep, that's a little harder game, strategy game, but it's we very fun. Too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so these are good. Good. So find some people to play with you. Just yeah. step out of the realm of comfort and go and play bring, some and, games. And bring play into your classroom, right? Think about exactly. what you can. So what types of things the student this is this is the let me summarize maybe if you're trying to figure out how to connect to your students in your classroom and they're not falling in love and they're not you know getting excited by the material and whatnot find what does excite them and then think okay what in what we're doing is like that and how can i make connections to that if they if they really love taylor swift music god help them then is there something <laughs> you can do can you connect to the lyrics of her song back to what we're doing in history Right. Napoleon is like Taylor Swift. Right. There we go. You know, these sorts of things. Um, but those types of connections, um, my favorite image for a teacher, you know, we always talk about the teacher, the magister, the the master of studies and whatnot. I, I, I need to write about this very soon, too. But my favorite image for the teacher is Pontifex, bridge builder. Right. Yeah. See, what you're building a bridge between is between the student's heart, the things that they naturally love or happen to love. And. And the material you didn't have. And if you can find something in the material that corresponds to something in the student's heart, you use that. And then you can make a game that puts those things in connection with each other or give them a chance to act it out. Give them a chance to get out of their chairs and interact with one another and dig deeper into it. That's going to increase your odds of getting that student to love what you're doing. You want them to, anything that has them running home to their parents saying, mom, you won't believe what we did in school today. Yeah. It's probably <laughs> going down the right path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Joshua Gibbs has a lot of ideas in his blog posts and, mm. and things of doing fun things with his students and doing meals, even feast meals he'll do with his students. Yeah. After they study a book, then they have a feast day. And I love that. Those are the kinds Great of idea. things that I think uh, teachers should be thinking about. Um, okay, so as we close up our, um, our discussion, which this has been great fun, um, one of the... Um, questions I like to ask my listeners at the, or sorry, my guest at the end of the episode is to tell me either a quote that has had a lot of meaning to you in your life or a book you w wish you had read sooner in your life. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll do a quote. I've got a, I've got a couple that all come from Narnia, but I'll just pick one. Um, when in the voyage of the Dawn Treader, when uh, the characters are at Romandu's island and Romandu is a retired star and he's being slowly made young again um, so that he can go back and become a star again. Um, and Eustace is kind of blown away by the notion that this is a retired star. And he says, you know, in our world, stars are just balls of flaming gas. 
And Ramanda replies to him, even in your world, my son, that's not what a star is. That's only what it's made of. And that is so fundamentally shaped the way I approach the world and science and all sorts of things. It is not, I, I'm constantly reminded by that quote, never to confuse the um, physical description of a thing with the truth of a thing. That's really good. I love that. Well, I want to encourage our listeners to get a copy of your book on teaching fairy stories. It's a very excellent uh, book. And then I know you have an uh, essay coming out soon that'll be in the ACCS Classes Journal. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you said the essay is called Beautiful Arts and the Imagination, the Formation of the Soul, and the Formation of the Soul. So once that is out, we will add it to the show notes. It might not be out when this episode comes out right away, but you can come back and look at the show notes anytime. And, and then Junius and I will add some uh, really great titles of books that will help form your imagination into the show notes as well. Thank you, Junius, for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. This has been so much fun. Thank you for listening. You can get involved in a few ways. There's a Facebook page where we actively discuss the ideas around classical education. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. And if you want to help offset our production costs, you can support the podcast financially by going to www.classicaleducationpodcast.com forward slash support. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once said, well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be in a few words this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know best of all what it is to behave under it as in the presence of a father who is in heaven.